events, cause and effect, we analyse what went right and what went wrong, as we discover that many outcomes can be predicted, planned for, and even prevented. I'm John Chigi, and this is Causality. This episode is brought to you by ManyTrix, makers of helpful apps for the Mac. Visit manytricksalloneword.com slash pragmatic for more information about their amazingly useful apps. We'll talk more about them during the show. Causality is part of the Engineered Network. To support our shows, including this one, head over to our Patreon page and for other great shows, visit engineered.network today. Deep Water Horizon. To finish the job, just pick the reading that you want to believe. On the 20th of April in 2010, at 9.45pm at night, a 560 million US dollar rig called the Deepwater Horizon exploded, causing the largest marine oil spill in history. The Deepwater Horizon was a modern, proven designed drilling rig, and three of the largest and most experienced drilling companies in the world were involved with its operation, including BP, British Petroleum, Transocean, and Halliburton. Transocean is a US owned, Switzerland-based oil industry support company that specialises in deep water drilling equipment. Up to the time of this incident, this specific rig had run for seven years with no downtime and no lost time from personal injuries. The Deepwater Horizon at the time was also the most successful deep water drilling rig in the world and held the record of the deepest well drilled at a depth of 10.5 kilometres from sea level. It was built by Hyundai Heavy Industries at the Olsen Shipyard in South Korea, with construction of the rig beginning in 1998 and being completed in 2001. The Deepwater Horizon was 396 feet or 120 metres long and 256 feet or 78 metres wide and was capable of operating at a depth of 8,000 feet, or 2.4 kilometres, underwater, could be expanded to a maximum depth of 10,000 feet, 3 kilometres, underwater, with a maximum total drilling depth of 30,000 feet, or 9.1 kilometres. The structure itself weighed a total of 33,000 tonnes. Historically, oil and gas companies have preferred fixed platforms, or jack-up rigs, that physically connect entirely to the seabed and rise far above the mean sea level, above the weather. These are safer, cheaper to operate, though truly fixed platforms are initially more expensive to build, and their most common constraint is simply depth, being limited to typically about 1,600 feet or 500 metres of water depth. The price of oil and gas directly drove companies to explore new oil and gas reserves that were out of reach of existing fixed platforms, leading to the creation of what are sometimes called deep water rigs. These rigs could operate without a rigid physical tether to the ocean floor and could open up vast arrays of the ocean floor previously inaccessible, however at significantly more cost. For these reasons only, when the oil and gas supply and demand equation made it feasible, were these deeper oil and gas fields attempted to be tapped into. A deep water rig is a semi-submersible platform that connects to the wellhead via a section steel pipe from the main rig floating on the surface. The submersible sections are filled with seawater and when in position and emptied, allowing them to rise above to the surface fully when being moved between operational locations. These rigs are typically tethered loosely to sections of the sea floor and held in a more precise position by using a set of lateral thrusters. They are considered to be more stable than previous drill ships as they are both wider and less subject to pitch, roll and yaw due to wave action with a deeper stability point further beneath the water surface than a ship can have. The Deepwater Horizon rig is purely a drilling rig whose job is to drill the well and cap it so that a future oil rig managed by BP would connect to that specific well to extract and process or transport that oil to shore. The process of capping off is referred to as temporary abandonment and the contract was to drill the well, seal it, leave it temporarily abandoned as per normal practice for wells such as these. Days, weeks or months later, a production rig would then remove these 
and ready the wellhead for use. Transocean owned and operated the rig and were currently contracted by BP to deliver the Macondo well in the Macondo Prospect. The average cost of running this rig was $1 million US dollars a day. This cost covered everything, including staffing, supplying, operating, and maintaining the rig. The Macondo Prospect itself is more technically known as the Mississippi Canyon Block 252, or MC 252 for short, and is located in the Gulf of Mexico, 66 kilometers or 41 miles off the coast of Louisiana. This specific Macondo Prospect well began 1.6 kilometers or 5,100 feet below mean sea level, with a further 4 kilometers or 13,100 feet deep below the seafloor tapping into a field of an estimated 110 million barrels. The well was originally budgeted to cost 96 million US dollars to construct. Drilling of this well bore began in February of 2010. And as is sometimes the case, with uncertain geological formations, drill pipe sections that may disconnect, there were different materials and operational issues in making progress in the following weeks. This had led to a heavy negative impact to the overall project schedule. Without going into too much detail about how wells of this depth are constructed, at a high level, the first section of the well bore is the largest and drilled down to a set depth. After this, a smaller diameter pipe is inserted and cement is pumped into the bottom. With nowhere else to go, the cement returns up the outside of that pipe between the outer pipe wall and the well bore itself. To confirm the cement has correctly and consistently set, a cement bond log test is performed where an acoustic probe is lowered and raised along the length of the cemented section to ensure that there are no voids and the cement has set correctly. If any areas are found to be poorly set, The casing can be perforated and additional cement can be injected into that location to strengthen and repair that area. Upon completion and the cement setting, the next segment is then drilled down below this point and the process is repeated until reaching the desired depth. Segments are typically constructed using multiple pipe sections. The final production casing design for the wellbore can then use multiple diameter segments if so desired with so-called tie-back liners of a larger diameter running a set distance down the well, with the final segment smaller and effectively sealed by the cement from the liners above it where those two meet. Alternatively, a single pipe string that is smaller but fits within the entirety of the well bore is both simpler and faster to install. On the other hand, more cement is required to fill the entire length of the well bore to then complete the wellhead, though overall it is cheaper. Now to talk about the incident itself. By the 20th of April in 2010, the wellhead completion was now 43 days behind its original schedule, and it was now approaching a total of 54 million US dollars over budget. The cement seal had been pumped into the final section, and at 12:35 a.m. early in the morning of the 20th, Halliburton completed the cementing procedure. After a 16 and a half hour setting time, the well was able to enter a leak testing phase ahead of final disconnection and temporary abandonment, effectively what would be the end of the job. A tour of the drilling floor was conducted the day of the incident, with senior personnel from BP physically on the rig at the time, as the final phases of the negative pressure test was underway by the day shift tool pusher Wyman Wheeler. A tool pusher is responsible for keeping the rig able to run with all necessary tools, equipment, and supplies, and senior tool pushers are regularly seen as part administrative and coordinative for all day-to-day drilling efforts. At 5pm, Chris Pleasant, the subsea supervisor from Transocean, started his shift slightly early, observing and then discussing the initial results of Wyman's negative pressure test, where Wyman was concerned that 15 barrels of mud had leaked out during that pressure test. Ideally, there would be none. Several of the pressure readings had also fluctuated unusually during the test, which was causing Wyman some concerns. At the 6pm change of shift, the night shift crew entered the already crowded drill shack and Wyman strongly recommended additional testing be performed to confirm the cement job had sealed. 
Jason Anderson was the tool pusher for the night shift and took Wyman's lead and decided to rerun the test to confirm the pressure readings. Anderson was on his final night shift on the Deepwater Horizon and was due to fly off the rig in the morning. He was currently on the rig to train a replacement, however the trainee wasn't there. Anderson had been with the Deepwater Horizon rig since its launch in 2001, and a recent promotion meant he would not be returning to that role again, and he was due to fly out to a different rig the next day. The second negative pressure test showed several erratic readings before settling at a consistently high reading of 1,400 psi, which led Anderson to an attempt a third negative pressure test, this time using the adjacent kill line rather than the primary drill pipe. At 7.55pm, the pressure test on the kill line was completed, and a zero psi reading at the end of that test was interpreted by Anderson as evidence that the well had been properly sealed. He believed the high pressure in the main pipe to the well was caused by a bladder effect and could be ignored safely. He suggested it was caused by the fluid column pressure being exerted through the closed valve bladder into the well pipework, effectively exerting pressure at the wellhead from above rather than from below, interfering with the instrument's function. Donald Vedreen, BP's well site leader, accepted Anderson's explanation after a brief consultation with Houston and gave approval for the final fit-off and completion. At 9.31pm, as they are preparing to unlatch, the drill floor reported pressure readings once again, but higher than expected and fluctuating. At 9.41pm, on CCTV, water spray and mud was observed spraying through the facility. An attempt was made to contact the drill floor on all three phone lines, but there was no answer. At that point, mud was erupting from the well up to 74 metres or 240 feet into the air and raining down over the ocean and the rig itself. In an attempt to shut off the flow from the well, multiple valves were shut off. However, it was too late. The well was out of control and experiencing a blowout, which is an uncontrolled release of crude oil or natural gas from the well. Oil wells will always contain some proportion of hydrocarbon gases, some more than others. This particular well had a measurable quantity of methane, and with little to no wind that evening, the methane quickly collected within the drill rig. Although natural methane has no smell, the gas detectors installed throughout the rig read concentrations above the LEL or lower explosive limit such that any spark, no matter how small, would ignite the methane. However, no audible alarms from the gas detectors went off throughout the facility, although visual alarms at 9.47pm appeared first in the shale shaker house and then the drill floor. At 9.48pm, a call was placed to the nearby support vessel, the Bankston, advising them to move to a safe distance away from the rig to a standby hold position. At 9.49pm, the methane had reached the air intakes of the diesel generators, leading to an over-revving of the generator, followed by an overspeed trip and a loss of power circuits on the platform. Shortly thereafter, two explosions followed close together. Shortly after the explosions, the bridge sounded the general alarm and announced over the PA system to report to emergency stations. At 9.51pm, the bridge announced over the PA system, instructing all personnel to now proceed to the forward lifeboats for evacuation. At that time, there were 126 people on board, and those that were able made immediately for the lifeboats. At 9.56pm, and despite the captain's initial protest, Pleasant disregarded the objection and triggered the emergency disconnect system from the bridge panel. Despite the indicators suggesting that the blowout preventer, EDS, was fully functional, unfortunately, some issue or possible damage to the EDS had rendered it non-functional, and the rig remained tethered to the wellhead below. At 9.59pm, three personnel departed the bridge and headed to the engine room in an attempt to restore power. They were unsuccessful. At 10.28pm, 
the final signal was made by the captain to abandon the vessel and all remaining able personnel evacuated. A total of 115 people escaped to the nearby support vessel, the Bankston. Jason Anderson and the drill crew were never found. At 10.21am on the 22nd of April 2010, the burnt remnants of the Deepwater Horizon rig slipped beneath the ocean and sunk one and a half kilometres to the bottom, fracturing all remaining pipes connecting to the well and allowing crude oil to leak completely unchecked into the Gulf of Mexico. Eleven people had died. Jason Anderson, senior tool pusher. Aaron Dale Burkeen, crane operator. Donald Clark, assistant driller. Stephen Ray Curtis, assistant driller. Gordon Jones, drilling fluid specialist. Roy Wyatt Kemp, assistant driller. Carl Kleppinger Jr., floor hand. Keith Blair Manuel, senior drilling fluid specialist. Dewey Rivette, driller. Shane Rosto, lead roughneck. And Adam Weiss, floor hand. Before we go any further, I'd like to talk about our sponsor for this episode, and that's Many Tricks, makers of helpful apps for the Mac, whose apps do, you guessed it, many tricks. Their apps include Butler, KeyMau, Leech, Desktop Curtain, TimeSync Moon, Name Mangler, Resolutionator, and Witch. There's so much to talk about for each app they make, so we're going to touch on the highlights for five of them. Witch. You should think about Witch as a supercharger for your Command Tab app switcher. If you've got three or four documents open at once in any one app, then Witch's beautifully simple pop-up quickly lets you pick exactly the one you're looking for. Recently updated, you can now also switch between tabs as well as apps and app windows and horizontal or vertical menu bar switching panels with text search capability for switching. You can now show the frontmost app in the menu bar icon and it also has touch bar support and much, much more. Name Mangler. Suppose you've got a whole bunch of files to rename and you want to do it quickly, efficiently and in large numbers. Then Name Mangler is for you and it's great for creating staged renaming sequences with powerful rejects pattern matching recently enhanced showing the result as you go and if you mess it up just revert back to where you started and try again moom makes it easy to move any of your windows to whatever screen positions you want halves corners edges fractions of the screen and then you can even save and recall your favorite window arrangements with a special auto arrange feature when you connect or disconnect an external display it was recently updated to be even faster now with touch bar support as well and there's some keyboard integration with adobe's apps too it's the first app I load on a new Mac because it's just so awesome. Time sync. You can track your time spent in apps or activities on your Mac the simple and easy way with Time sync. You can then pull your apps by common activities, create custom trackers for non-Mac activities, and its simple but powerful reporting feature shows you exactly where your time went so you can plan better and stay focused. Resolutionator is just so simple. It's a drop-down menu from the menu bar and you can change the resolution of the display to whatever you like that's currently connected to your Mac. The best part though, you can even set the resolution to fit more pixels that are actually there. Very handy when you're stuck on your laptop and you need more screen real estate. And now that's just five of their great apps and that's only half of them. All of these apps have free trials. You can download them from manytricks, all one word, dot com slash pragmatic and you can easily try them out before you buy them. They're all available also from the website or through the Mac App Store. Now, if you visit that URL, you can take advantage of a special discount off their very helpful apps. Exclusively for Engineer Network listeners, simply use Pragmatic18. That's Pragmatic the word and one eight the numbers in the discount code box in the shopping cart and you'll receive 25% off. Now, this offer is only available to Engineer Network listeners for a limited time. So take advantage of it while you can. Thank you to Many Tricks for sponsoring the Engineered Network. After the incident, U.S. President Barack Obama announced the creation of the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill and Offshore Drilling, a team of seven, with Richard Sears appointed as a scientific advisor to the commission, who had been a VP at Shell early in his career. For 86 days, oil leaked 4.9 million barrels, or 210 million U.S. gallons, or 780,000 cubic metres, were estimated to have escaped from that well until it was reported as being sealed on the 19th of September 2010. Beaches were closed for months and years in some cases throughout the Gulf while the cleanup continued. According to satellite imagery, the spill directly affected 68,000 square miles, that's 180,000 square kilometres of ocean, which is comparable to the size of Oklahoma. 
relief wells were drilled, allowing the Macondo well to be plugged, after which they were also plugged finally, stopping the flow, after which they were also plugged, finally stopping the flow. A study found the incident estimated that over 82,000 birds, 6,000 sea turtles and 26,000 marine mammals were killed as a result of this incident. In Louisiana alone in 2013, 4.9 million pounds, that's 2,200 tonnes, of oily material was removed from beaches as oil cleanup crews worked four days a week on 55 miles, that's 89 kilometres, of the Louisiana shoreline alone. Between the energy, fishing, shrimping and tourism industries, the Gulf region lost an estimated quarter of a million jobs in 2010 alone. So what went wrong? While the specifications of this well sound impressive in terms of depth, it was far from the first well ever drilled at this depth, of either seawater or through the earth, and others had not had the same outcome. The technology being used wasn't new, and the technology was relatively well understood. We're going to break this down by human factors before and on the day. Let's start with those on the day. A good quote from Professor Robert B, the University of California, Berkeley, and one of the investigators put it well, and I quote, we think of things the way we want it to be, not as it is. So if we want it to be okay, we find everything we can to support that thinking, end quote. The day shift tool pusher, Wyman Wheeler, ran the first test, and it was done on the drill pipe as per the standard negative test procedures, The second test was done on the drill pipe by the night shift and a third on the kill line. It monitored it for 30 minutes and noted that there was no flow or pressure change in the kill line. And based on this, coupled with a bladder effect theory, they chose to ignore the pressure buildup in the drill pipe observed in the previous two tests on the drill pipe. The kill pipe, however, was connected to the same downhole chamber that the drill pipe was which means it should have had exactly the same reading. Investigators concluded that the kill pipe must have been blocked with some foreign material, leading to a flat reading. But with all evidence destroyed in the incident, it's not able to be verified for certain. In more modern control systems with remotely monitoring now commonplace, even with the destruction of the drill rig, during the lead-up to and through the initial stages of the incident, all SCADA process data was remotely transmitted and recorded by BP in their Houston offices. The data on the trends clearly showed that during the negative pressure tests, the pressure had increased to 1,400 psi. Had the wellhead sealed properly, the pressure would have remained static and unchanging. For some reason, Jason Anderson had interpreted these high readings differently. He believed the rising pressure in the well was caused by the bladder effect and could be ignored. The investigation rejected this explanation on the basis that although there was such a phenomenon, the bladder effect is generally only very small in its influence, and something to the level of 1,400 psi was far beyond any bladder effect observed. Interestingly, this meant that they believed the false reading of the kill pipe and ignored the correct reading from the drill pipe. Let's look at some human factors in the weeks before the incident. There were several design choices that we need to cover. Firstly, the final casing design. During the first few weeks of April, the decision about which casing design to use for the final segment changed repeatedly. BP were adjusting the technical content of their forward plan review and prior to April in its initial version had indicated a long string casing those that took the entire length of the bore, were recommended against because of the inherent risks of having fewer gas barriers between the well and the surface. However, on the 15th of April, a revised forward plan review referred to the long string casing as being the primary option, and although it retained some acknowledgement of the risks of long string casings, it also considered that design the best economic case and well-integrity case for future completion operations. After going back and forth internally for weeks, the decision with the updated BP Drilling and Completion MOC Initiate document 
noting the liner option would add an additional 7 to 10 million US dollars to the completion cost and it was hence rejected and instead a single long string would be used. Secondly, the string alignment. As discussed previously, the well is lined with steel tubing. The space between the well bore and the tubing is called the annulus and filling this area requires that cement is pumped through the pipe and back out via the annulus. The casing must be centrally positioned within the bore, otherwise when the cement is pumped into the well, it will not have equal thickness and will flow between the bore wall and the tubing. To ensure this doesn't happen, devices known as centralizers are used to ensure the correct positioning of the inner tubing within the well bore. There is no specific prescription of exactly how many centralizers should be used. The guidelines simply say enough should be used. BP was working with Halliburton on the cementing and wellbore design, and it was up to Halliburton to perform a process model to calculate the correct number of centralizers in order to ensure that tubing was held correctly in position. Jesse Gagliano was seconded to BP from Halliburton to advise on this specific wellhead, and on the 15th of April, his calculations utilising the OptisM modelling software indicated that they would require 21 centralisers in total. However, on the Deepwater Horizon rig, they only had six centralisers in stock. Gregory Walls, BP's drilling engineering team leader, took the initiative to organise the urgent dispatch of 15 additional Weatherford centralisers with stop collars to the rig, stating in an email, and I quote, we need to honour the modelling to be consistent with our previous decisions to go with the long string, end quote. Noting that the long string being a reference to the design decision above that saves 7 to 10 million US dollars. John Guide, BP's well team leader, reversed Walls' decision, expressing concern that the type of stabilisers about to be dispatched to the rig were of a different design and may snag during insertion in the well bore, which, were that to occur, would even further delay completion of the well. Additional time would also be required to fit the additional centralizers, and in an email, Guide stated, and I quote, it will take 10 hours to install them. I do not like this, and I'm very concerned about using them, end quote. Email traffic between the BP engineering team and site personnel with the following email on the 16th of April, only days before the cement job was undertaken. It was from Brett Kokalis, a BP operations drilling engineer, to Brian Morell, another drilling engineer in BP's team, and I quote, Even if the hole is perfectly straight, a straight piece of pipe, even in tension, will not seek the perfect centre of the hole unless it has something to centralise it, end quote. So far, so good. The email reads, unfortunately, it continues. And again, I quote, Who cares? It's done, end of story. We'll probably be fine and we'll get a good cement job. End quote. Upon hearing this outcome on the 18th, Jesse Gagliano from Halliburton re-ran his process design model, this time using only seven centralizers. And his report indicated that the well, and I quote, is considered to have severe gas flow problem. End quote. Emphasis on severe by Gagliano, not me. Despite the risk, the recommendations and the expert modelling, BP proceeded to use just the six centralizers that they had on board, the Deepwater Horizon. The position John Guide had taken in driving this decision was that if there was a cement repair job necessary, they would wear the cost of repair if it came to that. That assumed any leaks detected would have been kept sealed while the cement repair took place. And unfortunately, that wasn't what happened. Thirdly, the cement that was used. The mixture is adjusted for each well based on the pressure and depth of the well bore and the surrounding geological formation stability. Since this particular well bore was considered to be fragile, the recommendation from Halliburton was to nitrify the cement. Nitrifying is a technique where, during cement mixing and injection, nitrogen bubbles are injected into the cement that creates a foam. The foam has to be balanced and stable constantly throughout injection, otherwise bubbles can coalesce, 
which then create larger voids, and in some cases can create vertical channels or tracks as they rise through the bore. Halliburton tested the nitrification in their Louisiana test laboratory three months prior and again with the exact mixture at the Macondo well only a month prior to the incident, and both times the results showed the foam was unstable and led to void formation and pore strength with pore sealing properties. Concerningly, these two specific findings were never communicated outside of Halliburton and not to BP. The day prior to the cement injection, a further test was run in the laboratory by Halliburton and by using a longer settling time, the nitrification technique was considered to be successful. Transocean had objected to using nitrification on the basis that in wells this deep, they believed that it would not stabilise or set correctly at depth. BP, however, chose to go with Halliburton's most recent recommendation, backed by their most recent test results, being unaware of their previous test's findings in the months prior. During the investigation, a retest showed that the foam was inherently unstable and that solids settled out prior to settling time, leading to a cement with inconsistent properties depending upon where the cement was in the wellbore. That is to say, it set more strongly or weaker as the depth in the wellbore increased. Fourthly, circulating mud. Before cementing a well, it's common practice to circulate the drilling mud through the well, hence bringing the mud at the bottom all the way up to the top of the drilling rig. Sometimes it's referred to as a bottoms up. It's a cleaning process, but it's also used to check if absorbed gases have leaked in. The American Petroleum Institute recommends at least one mud circulation. However, BP estimated that a single mud circulation of 18,360 feet would take about 6 to 12 hours. The logs recorded that on the 19th of April 2010, the day before the incident, mud circulation was completed in only 30 minutes, which is obviously physically impossible. Hence, no full single circulation occurred. This dramatically increased the possibility that when they mixed the cement, there could be mud cement channeling during injection, leading directly to larger defects in the cementing process. Fifthly, the cement inspection, or perhaps lack thereof, it is a standard practice, as previously stated at the outset of the episode, that cement jobs of wells be performed upon their completion. A 2007 study by the Minerals Management Service, MMS, since split into three separate federal agencies in the US, found that cementing was the single most significant factor in 18 of 39 well blowouts in the Gulf of Mexico over a 14-year period to that point. According to government regulations, if there is an indication of a potentially inadequate cement job, the company must, first, pressure test the casing shoe, second, run a temperature survey, three, run a cement bond log, or four, use a combination of these techniques to verify the integrity. BP contracted their inspections of this type to third parties, and in this particular case, a specialist team from the company Schlumberger had been pre-organized to attend the rig, and on the 18th of April 2010, they arrived. As noted by Schlumberger, and I quote, BP contracted with Schlumberger to be available to perform a cement bond log, should BP request those services, end quote. At approximately 7am on the morning of the incident, BP informed Schlumberger that their services would not be required for a cement bond log test after all. As a result of this, the Schlumberger crew departed the Deepwater Horizon at approximately 11.15am on the regularly scheduled BP helicopter flight back to the mainland. We note that the first negative pressure test performed started after Schlumberger had left the rig, and the test results from a negative pressure test would determine whether a cement bog log would be required. That is to say, BP predetermined that they would not test anything at that point. If they found problems, they would have to get the Schlumberger test crew back again, run the bond log test, trace the badly set areas, and then repair them. The investigation committee engaged Gordon Aker Jr., a registered professional mechanical engineer, to comment on BP's decision regarding the bond log test. He responded that it was unheard of not to perform a cement bond log on a well using a single casing, 
and described BP's decision not to conduct a cement bond log as horribly negligent. The costs for completing a cement bond log for this well would have been approximately $128,000 US dollars. However, cancellation costs for this to Schlumberger were only $10,000 US. During the investigation, Mark Haffel, one of BP's drilling engineers, defended the decision not to do the test, stating, and I quote, Cement bond log is an evaluation tool that is not always 100% right. It's not a quantitative tool. It does not tell you the exact percentage of cement at any given point. It's a tool in the engineering toolbox that has to be used with a bit of caution. End quote. Sixthly, the blowout preventer didn't. That is to say, the blowout preventer, or BOP, it's approximately 16 metres high and it has a built-in safety cutout system called the EDS, Emergency Disconnect System. It's designed with a mechanical pincer action that seals the pipes to the surface, severing them entirely, detaching and allowing the rig to separate from the well completely, sealing off the well bore. The Cameron Model 2001 BOP was subject to testing and that testing in 2002 showed that 50% of the BOPs that were tested failed to cut the pipe under flow and pressure scenarios likely during an incident, like the one at Macondo. Initial findings were that the battery that drove the pincer mechanism should have had a full 24 volts DC charge. However, it only had 7.6 volts DC charge when tested months later, and this was originally thought to be the cause. However, further analysis showed the pipe itself was off-centre and hence was not able to be fully bifurcated by the pincer mechanism. Whether the pipe had become off-centre due to a poor installation, use or damage from the explosion remains undetermined. Okay, one more. The audible alarms were turned off. Mike Williams was the chief electronics technician for Transocean and had confirmed after the incident that gas levels had been running high enough in recent weeks to prohibit any hot work on the platform. Hot work includes welding, wiring changes that could potentially cause sparking and so on. Ordinarily, gas levels that high would have triggered the audible alarms. However, the alarms had been disabled in order to prevent false alarms from waking workers during the night. Of course, alarms can have multiple set points. One could have had a warning level alarm that was shelved every few days during the no hot work period whilst retaining a higher set point to go off in more critical situations such as this. However, that was not the design. It took the Commission six months to assemble information regarding the incident with seven key conclusions. I'll draw attention to just three of them. A series of identifiable mistakes made by BP, Halliburton and Transocean that reveal systematic failures in risk management that they place in doubt the safety culture of the entire industry. Fundamental reform will be needed in both the structure of those in charge of regulatory oversight and their internal decision-making process to ensure their political autonomy, technical expertise, and their full consideration of environmental protection concerns. Regulatory oversight alone will not be sufficient to ensure adequate safety. The oil and gas industry will need to take its own unilateral steps to increase dramatically safety throughout the industry including self-policing mechanisms that supplement governmental enforcement. End quotes. In 2011, a White House commission blamed BP and its partners for a series of cost-cutting decisions and an inadequate safety system, concluding that the incident resulted from systemic root causes that might well recur. In November of 2012, BP and the United States Department of Justice settled federal criminal charges where BP pleaded guilty to 11 counts of involuntary manslaughter, two misdemeanors, and a felony count of misleading Congress. BP also agreed to four years of government monitoring of its safety practices and ethics, and the EPA announced that BP would be temporarily banned from new contracts with the United States government. Both Robert Calusa and Donald Vidrine in 2012 were described in their sentencing as having negligent and grossly negligent conduct of defendants Kaluza and Vidrine proximately caused the death of these 11 men and were found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. BP and the Department of Justice agreed to pay 4.525 billion US dollars in fines and other payments and as of February 2003 criminal and civil settlements and payments to a trust fund 
had cost the company a total of $42.2 billion US dollars. In September of 2014, a US District Court judge also ruled that BP was primarily responsible for the oil spill due to gross negligence and reckless conduct, and in July 2015, BP agreed to pay $18.7 billion US in fines, which remains the largest corporate settlement in US history. On the 2nd of December 2015, however, the manslaughter charges were dropped, as more information came from subsequent investigations highlighting the detail of the design decisions made within the BP organisational hierarchy. Let's talk a little bit about the movie. Unusually, an incident on this show has been turned into a movie, and whilst the stories behind movie plots involving the Titanic are greatly at variance with many of the established facts, the Deepwater Horizon incident has well-documented detail, despite the three key parties involved denying many details in the investigative process. In the movie, Transocean were consistently portrayed in the best possible light, despite the fact they were still negligent in pushing for well completion, despite conflicting information, and their approach to alarm silencing was fundamentally flawed. In the movie, the character Mike Williams rescues Andreas Flatus, uh, which didn't happen in that way in the real incident, though it is true the crew stayed behind and uh, had missed several lifeboats, and some did jump to safety, including Mike Williams, who actually did jump an estimated 10 stories into the water to escape, and he was plucked from the waves by a rescue craft, and he was indeed badly injured. Importantly in the movie... The critical negative pressure test scenes portrayed Transocean employees Jason Anderson and Jimmy Harrell. During these scenes, Transocean were raising concerns and BP were ignoring them and Donald Vedrine suggested the bladder effect explanation. However, in reality, this was Anderson and Vedrine had actually contacted Houston to consult before finally agreeing that the test qualified as successful. Anderson was pushing for acceptance of the test result, but the movie set up Transocean as the good guys, when the reality is somewhat less clear-cut. Such are movies. Of course, Hollywood needs to add some romance, some drama, and some good versus evil to make what they think is a more compelling story. However, the truth is that whilst BP was considered the most to blame, both Halliburton and Transocean share a non-trivial amount of blame as well. And having said all of that... The movie itself is still quite instructive and entertaining to a point, and for those that haven't worked in the oil and gas industry, it's a relatively good reflection of the work environment, the hazards, and many of the attitudes and camaraderie remote workers display. Despite the bending of some of the facts then, it's still worth a watch if you haven't seen it. But I digress. So what do we conclude from all of this? Firstly, the research for this episode was quite difficult, owing to the fact that all of the major companies involved at different times provided contradictory statements about what happened, by whom, in what order. That, coupled with the commission report and future investigations of the damage by submersible craft, muddied things significantly. The most damning, irrefutable evidence comes from the internal email communications prior to the incident and the SCADA readings taken during the lead-up to the blowout. Hence, There are two specific points to make about the Deepwater Horizon incident. First, and foremost, money. During the decision not to ship the additional centralizers, if there were any genuine concerns, the additional centralizers would snag because they were the wrong type for the application, then why was there no suggestion that alternative centralizers be sought out? There is no evidence this was even attempted and certainly no cost-risk assessment of delaying the job further until the better-suited centralizers could be located and flown to the rig. It was predetermined that a bond log test would not be needed. That makes no sense, except if you think about the money. At a million dollars a day average cost for the Horizon rig, we could do some quick cost-saving estimates. $10 $10 million saved using a single long string over a tieback. $0.4 million equivalent of 10 hours saved by not fitting the additional centralizers. More also saved by not attempting to find alternative models, but since this didn't happen, we can't include it. Half a million dollars or 
equivalent of 11 and a half hours saved by not performing full mud circulation. A tenth of a million saved by not running the bond log test. More were saved because it would have found problems, most likely, and they would have had additional costs to fix those problems. So in total, let's say BP had saved about $11 million. Okay, great. I mean, that's not trivial. That's a reasonable sum of money. BP announced a revised cost estimate for the entire incident a year ago and has estimated a total N10 cost of 65 billion US dollars from the time of the incident to a point in time 12 months ago. Not to mention the incalculable cost of 11 people's lives. And then suddenly, a million dollars doesn't seem like very good value, does it? Secondly, for the one of a more succinct way of phrasing it, it's an extreme case of wishful thinking. In order to finish the job, and then you can just go home the next day, all you have to do is pick the reading that you want to believe. That one from the kill pipe, in this case, and everything will be fine. You can pack up and move on. The Deepwater Horizon incident is a bit different to me personally for several reasons. In my current job, we had an acted, on-stage reenactment of the negative pressure test and the site tour with role-playing the real scenario and role-playing an alternative scenario where the drillers stopped the job and prevented the catastrophe. This was presented to the entire section of our company, nearly a thousand people in total, that drive home the message. And I've had the great fortune to meet someone who worked on the cleanup exercise after the incident only last year. The research and the movie also drove home the same point. If you're concerned about safety, stop the job. Don't hesitate. It's a fundamental tenet of the modern oil and gas industry and has been for decades. It's not a new thing. The simple truth is that saving some money by delivering early is of absolutely no benefit if people are injured or worse killed, or if there's environmental damage, or if it costs equal or more in the long term. Risk reviews are designed to overcome this, and whilst people involved in this case followed a decision tree designed to make the correct risk decision, it was made without those involved having all of the facts Optimistic positions were taken rather than realistic positions and true risk reductions like seeking out the best possible centralizers were never undertaken. The truth is that drilling oil and gas wells is dangerous. It always has been. It always will be. The only difference really with deep water drilling is the cost is so much higher than on land such that when there are delays the pressure to complete is an order of magnitude more. And if you're in that position, you have to turn off the cost switch and focus on safety. If companies are well-run, diversified, stable, losing a bit of time and money on one job won't be a big problem. Because no matter how much money is on the line, if something goes wrong, it will never be worth it. If, whenever, there is any doubt, there is every doubt, and stop the job. If you're enjoying Causality and want to support the show, you can, like some of our backers, Carsten Hansen and John Whitlow. They and many others are patrons of the show via Patreon, and you can find it at patreon.com slash johnchigi or one word. Patron rewards include a named thank you on the website, a named thank you at the end of episodes, access to raw detailed show notes, as well as ad-free high quality releases of every episode. So if you'd like to contribute something, anything at all, there's lots of great rewards. And beyond that, it's all really, really appreciated. Beyond Patreon, there's also a PayPal for one-off contributions at paypal.me slash jhig. But if you're not in a position to support the show financially, that's completely fine. There's other ways you can help. Leave a rating or review on iTunes, favorite the episode in your podcast player app, or share this episode or the show with your friends or via social. All of these things help others discover the show and can make a huge difference too. I'd personally like to thank Many Tricks for once again sponsoring the Engineered Network. If you're looking for some Mac software that can do Many Tricks, remember specifically visit this URL, manytricks, or one word, dot com slash pragmatic for more information about their amazingly 
useful apps. Causality is part of the Engineered Network and you can find it at engineered.network and you can follow me on Mastodon at chigi at engineered.space or the network on Twitter at engineered underscore net. This was Causality. I'm John Chigi. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.